Start of Chapter 27 The Perilous March Allah blessed the eyes of Rafi. How did he succeed in finding the way from Karake to Nawa? Five days it had marched, when the army wept. No human ever made such a journey before. A soldier who took part in the march. At Hira, in late May 634, Khalid opened the Caliph's letter and read, In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, from the slave of Allah, Atik, son of Abu Qahafa, to Khalid, son of Al-Walid, peace be upon you. I render praise unto Allah, save whom there is no Allah, and invoke blessings on his Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. March until you reach the gatherings of the Muslims in Syria, who are in a state of great anxiety. Khalid stopped reading, fearing that this meant emotion and that at last the pressure of Umar against him had borne fruit. And what bitter fruit, Khalid muttered, this must be the work of that left-handed one. He is jealous of me for conquering Iraq. But his fears turned to joy as he read on. I appoint you commander over the armies of the Muslims and direct you to fight the Romans. You shall be commander over Abu Ubaida and those with him. Go with speed and high purpose, O father of Suleiman, and complete your task with the help of Allah, exalted be he. Be among those who strive for Allah. Divide your army into two and leave half with Mutanna, who shall be commander in Iraq. Let not more go with you than stay with him. After victory, you shall return to Iraq and resume command. Let not pride enter your mind, for it will deceive and mislead you. And let there be no delay. Lo, to Allah belongs all bounty, and he is the dispenser of rewards. Thus was Khalid appointed commander-in-chief of the Muslim forces in Syria. Khalid now set about the preparations for his march. He explained the instructions of the Caliph to Mutanna, divided his army into two and handed over one half of it to Mutanna. But in the division of the army, Khalid tried to keep all the companions of the Prophet wasallam, the immigrants and the Ansars, men held in special esteem by the soldiers. To this, Mutanna objected vehemently. I insist on a total execution of Abu Bakr's orders, he said. I shall have half the companions also, for it is by their presence that I hope to win victories. Khalid saw the gestures of Mutanna's claim. He revised the division to leave Mutanna a satisfactory share of the companions, particularly as these included many of the finest officers of the army. This done, Khalid was ready for the march to Syria. It was Abu Bakr's way to give his generals their mission, the geographical area in which that mission would be carried out and the resources that could be made available for that purpose. He would then leave it to his generals to accomplish their missions in whatever manner they chose. This is how he had launched Khalid into Iraq and this is how he was now launching Khalid into Syria. The mission given to Khalid was clear. He was to move with all speed to Syria, take command of the Muslim forces and fight the Romans until victory was achieved. What route Khalid should take to get to Syria was left to him and this was the most important immediate decision that Khalid had to take. The detailed location of the Muslim forces in Syria were not known to him. He knew, however, that they were in the general area of Busra and Jabiya and he had to get there fast. There were two known routes available to Khalid for his march. The first was the southern route via Domat al-Jandal, whence the army could move along the normal caravan track into Syria. This was the easiest and simplest approach, with ample water on the way and no enemy to interfere with this movement. But it was also the longest route and the movement could take considerable time to complete. The Caliph had emphasized speed, as the situation of the Muslims was apparently serious. So after due consideration, Khalid rejected this route. The other route was the northern one along the Euphrates to northeastern Syria. This too was a well-traveled route, but it would take Khalid away from the Muslim armies, and Roman garrisons on the Euphrates would bar his way. He could, no doubt, 
overcome this opposition, but again there would be delay. He had to find another way of getting to the Muslim forces in Syria. Khalid called the council of war and explained the situation to his officers. How can we find a route to Syria, he asked, by which we avoid the front of the Romans? They will certainly try to prevent us from going to the aid of the Muslims. His reference was to Roman garrisons along the northern route. We know of no way, the officers replied, that could take an army, though a single man might take such a route. Beware of leading the army astray. But Khalid was determined to find a new route and asked his question again. None responded except one noted warrior by the name of Rafi bin Umera. Rafi explained that there was indeed a route through the land of Samawa. The army could proceed from Hira to Kurakir via Anut Tamr and Muzayya, and this would be an easy march. Kurakir was a well-watered oasis in the west of Iraq. Thanks to Suwa, there was a little known route which led through a barren, waterless desert. At Suwa again, there was ample water, and one day's journey before Suwa, there was a spring which he knew would provide sufficient water for the army. The most dangerous part of the journey was from Kurakir to this spring, about 120 miles. But Rafi cautioned, You cannot take this route with an army. By Allah, even a lone traveller would attempt it at the peril of his life. It involves five days of extreme hardship without a drop of water and the ever-present of danger of losing the way. The officers present nodded agreement. To take the army on such a route where the entire force could get lost and die of thirst was something that no man in his right senses would consider. In a quiet voice Khalid said, We shall take this route. Seeing the look of alarm on the faces of his officers, he added, Let not your resolve be weakened. Know that the help of Allah comes according to your deserts. Let not the Muslims fear anything so long as they have the help of Allah. The effect of his words was instantaneous. With one voice his officers replied, You are a man on whom Allah has bestowed his good will. Do as you wish. And with cheerful enthusiasm, the army of Khalid set about its preparations for the march to Syria on a route that no army had travelled before and which was known only to one man, Rafi bin Umera. In early June 634, beginning of Rabiul Akhir, 13th Hijri, Khalid marched from Hira with an army of 9,000 men. No women and children accompanied the army. They were left behind under Khalid's orders for dispatch to Medina, where they would remain until it was convenient to have them move to Syria. The army moved via Anut Tamr, Sandauda, and Muzayya to Kurakir, and Mutanna accompanied Khalid up to here before returning to Hira to resume watch over the new frontier with Persia. For the night, the army camped at Kurakir and filled its water skins and other containers with supplies of water that were expected to last the men and animals five days. Early next morning, as the perilous march was about to start, Rafi again approached Khalid. He seemed uncertain of himself. O oh, commander, he pleaded, you cannot traverse this desert with an army. By Allah, even a lone traveller would attempt this journey only at the peril of his life. Khalid turned on him angrily. Woe to you, O Rafi, he said. By Allah, if I knew of any other route to get to Syria quickly, I would take it. Proceed as ordered. Rafi proceeded as ordered and led Khalid's army of 9,000 men into the desert. As usual, the men rode on camels while the horses were led. It was the month of June when the sun beat mercilessly upon the sands of the desert, destroying all traces of life and daring man to set foot on the tortured, waterless waste. Sensible men would not do this certainly not at this time of year, certainly not in such large numbers, and certainly not when the fate of the Muslims in Syria hung on their safe arrival. But the greatest glories of a man have never been achieved by sensible men. The soldiers were not sensible men. They were the warriors of Khalid, the sword of Allah, 
setting out to perform one of the greatest feats of military movement in history. The first three days passed uneventfully. The men were oppressed by the intense heat and glare, but they were inured to hardship and as long as there was water, all was well. But the water, which was meant to last five days, finished at the end of the third day. They had another two days journey ahead of them with not a drop of water. Silently, the column resumed the march on the fourth day. The heat now appeared to become more intense. There was no conversation on the march, for the men could think only of water and the horrors of getting lost in the desert and dying of thirst. They shuddered to think of what would happen if Rafay lost the way or was otherwise incapacitated. That night the men camped as usual, but there was no sleep. With the agony of fire in their throats and their tongues swollen in their mouths, they could only repeat in their minds the prayer, Sufficient for us is Allah, and what a good protector he is. Quran, chapter 3, verse 173. On the fifth morning began the last stage of the march, which would, by Allah's will, get them to the spring which Rafi knew. Mile after weary mile the column trudged in silence. Hour after painful hour the men struggled through sandy wastes, tortured by the pitiless clear and heat. The day's march was completed and the men still lived, though most of them had reached the limits of human endurance. The column was no longer a neat, orderly formation, as it had been at the start of the march. Many of the warriors were straggling in the rear of the column, hoping against hope that they would not fall by the wayside. As the head of the column reached the area where the spring was supposed to be, Rafi the guide could no longer see. He had been suffering from ophthalmia, and the blinding glare of the sun had worsened the condition of his eyes. He now wrapped part of his turban over his eyes and halted his camel. The men following him were horrified to see this and called to him piteously. O oh, Rafi, we are on the point of death. Have you not found the water? But Rafi could no longer see. In a voice which was little more than a hoarse whisper, he said, Look for two hillocks, like the breasts of a woman. The column moved on, and soon after the two hillocks were identified, and the guide informed accordingly. Look for a thorn tree shaped like a man in the sitting posture, ordered Rafi. A few scouts rode out to look for the tree, but returned a few minutes later to say that no such tree could be found. Lo, we belong to Allah, and indeed to him we shall return, said Rafi quoting a Quranic verse. Then we all perish. But look once again. The men looked again, and this time found the trunk of a thorn tree of which the remainder had vanished. Dig under its roots, instructed Rafi. The men dug under the roots, and in the words of Waqidi, water flowed out of the earth like a river. The men drank their fill, all the while praising Allah and invoking his blessings on Rafi. Then the animals were watered, and there was still water to spare. Hundreds of men filled their water skins and set off back on the route which they had travelled, looking for stragglers, of whom there were many. All were found and brought in alive. The perilous march was over. They had made it. It had never been done before. It would never be done again. Khalid had reached the border of Syria leaving behind the Roman frontier and its garrisons facing Iraq. They were now only a day's march from Suwa, where the desert ended and habitation began.